So, welcome to um, the Isopanishad class. Welcome to Isopanishad classes. We're going to begin today the Isopanishad. Uh, it's a very short Shastra. It has 18 verses. And um, I'll begin by saying a few words about the Isopanishad. Uh, it gets its name from the, uh, the first word of its, um, of its first verse, which is Isha. Isha Vasumidam Sarvam. Of course, it, uh, it has an invocation also, which is actually what we're going to read today, and we may actually do a, uh, we may do a few more verses, may do more than one verse. But uh, just to confirm, Yisra Upanishad does have uh, 18 mantras. So I got that, I got that right. So, uh, the invocation is a very famous Vedic verse, <clears throat> which goes as follows. Om Purnamadap Purnamidam Purnat Purnam Udachate Purnasya Purnam Adaya Purnam Eva Vashishate. So, as you probably noticed, the word Purna occurs a lot in this verse, in fact, uh, seven times. In this shloka, the, the word Purna occurs five, uh, seven times. So the word Purna means full or complete. And just like in English, uh, we have the word to fill or to fulfill. In other words, to fill fully. So to fulfill in English uh, means uh, to bring to completion or reality, achieve or realize something, to fulfill oneself, to gain happiness or satisfaction. Uh, so, very similar to the Sanskrit Purna. Uh, so, the verse begins by saying, Om Purnamadap uh, Purnamidam. So, Om, of course, invoking the Lord by the famous syllable Om. Adaha uh, and Idam are uh, sort of contrasting pronouns. So, Idam means this. And adaha means that. So in philosophical Sanskrit, uh, which tends to be very, like, how should I put it, ingeniously or extremely condensed sometimes. I mean, an example of that, of course, would be the sutra literature, like Vedanta Sutra or Brahma Sutra. Um, so in that literature, uh, in philosophical Sanskrit, idam meaning this, also just means this world, because this means something that is right before you, something which is in your presence. And so if we simply say this, we're talking about the world that <clears throat> is immediately before us, the world that we can see directly, the world in which we're living. And so idam means this or this world. And so because adaha, in contrast to idam, uh, tut or tud also means that in Sanskrit, but it, it's used for many other things, tud. But here, in terms of a direct contrast, this here, right before me, and that, which is beyond or, or away from me, uh, adaha comes to mean uh, the spiritual world, 
or the Supreme Lord. The Prabhupada translates it here in the word for word, idam means this phenomenal world, and Prabhupada translates adaha as that. Of course, in the, in the translation, he's, he translates it as the personality of Godhead is perfect and complete. Prabhupada translates the word purna as perfect and complete. And because he is completely perfect, all emanations from him. So let's, our, uh, well, read his translation. All emanations from him, such as this phenomenal world, are perfectly equipped as complete wholes. Whatever is produced of the complete whole is also complete in itself. Because he is the complete whole, even though so many complete units emanate from him, he remains the complete balance. So the first line I've translated on literally on Purnam Adak, Purnam Idam. That is Purna, and this is Purna. And then Purnat, which means from the Purna, from the complete, that which is uh, perfect and complete, as Prabhupada translates it, from the Purna, Purnam Udachate, Purna arises, Ud is up in Sanskrit, so in Achate, so uh, arises or comes. So Purna arises from Purna. This is very interesting. Of course, a very interesting verse. Purna arises from Purna. And then Purnasya Purnamadaya. Adaya means taking, in the sense of taking away. So taking Purna away from Purna. Purna Eva, only Purna remains. So this is a, sort of an ingenious statement that we have to think about. I mean, we know, if, if you're in the Hare Krishna movement, you probably know what this basically means, but uh, Avashishate means remains. Remains. So, as Prabhupada said, this is sort of spiritual physics. This is not uh, normally, if you have something which is complete and you take complete away, or if you take the fullness away from the full, there's actually nothing left. But here, you have something which is complete, which is full, you take the complete fullness away, and what remains is nothing but what you started with complete fullness. Uh, Krishna uses this kind of paradoxical language also in the Bhagavad Gita. And I think there's a, uh, there's a good comparison. Uh, Krishna uses similar language and really the point being that we're not dealing with material physics, with material space. This is different. So I'll read you those verses and I'll explain how they're, why I, I connect them. Uh, Krishna begins this discussion I'm referring to at uh, 9 4, chapter 9, text 4 of Bhagavad Gita, where he says, Maya by me, Tatam, is pervaded, Idang Sarvam, all of this. And again, the word Idam in the Gita means this material world. Krishna simply says, I pervade all this. All this mean all this world, this material world. Jagada Vyakta I pervade all this universe. Then he does actually say the universe. I pervade all this universe, Avyakta Murtina, with an unmanifested Murti. Murti means a form, a visible form. And, uh, but Krishna says here, with an in invisible form. It's very interesting. Because normally a murti is something you can see. You go to see the murti in the temple, the deity of Krishna. And here Krishna uses the word avyakta murtina with a form which is invisible, which is not manifested. I pervade all this universe. And matstani sarvabhutani, all beings stand in me. 
in the stand, of course, Sanskrit stani. So all beings stand or are present in me, but I am not uh, situated in them. Now here we have a paradox because Krishna said that I pervade this whole universe, but I'm not situated in the living beings who are actually standing in me. So Krishna pervades the world, but he's not situated in us, in, in living beings. And then Krishna says, having said, matstani sarva bhutani, sarva bhutani, that all, bhut, all living beings stand in me, or are situated in me, then Krishna says exactly the opposite. Natcha matstani bhutani, living beings are not standing in me are not situated in me. So this is not a contradiction, but it is a paradox. It, it looks like a contradiction. So Krishna says, Nacha matstani bhutani, and then he says, Pashyame yoga maishra, behold my mystic power, literally my governing yoga. Behold my yoga, which is aishwara, from the word ishwara, which is the ruling or governing or godly yoga. Behold that. Uh, and then Krishna says, Bhuta Bhrin, I sustain living beings. Nacha Bhuta Sto, I am not in living beings. I don't stand in them. Mamatma, myself, Bhuta Bhavana, is the source of living beings. This is There's a lot of theology going on here, as you can probably see. And then, so having made these two paradoxical statements, Krishna at 9.6 is going to say, okay, this is what I mean. He's going to explain how he's, living beings are in him, living beings are not in him, he's everywhere, he's not in living beings. What's going on here? So Krishna explains, yata, he's going to give you an analogy just as yata. He's going to explain what he's talking about by an analogy or a metaphor. So Krishna says, yata akasha stito nityam vayu sarvatra go mahan. So just as the great wind, and by that I think Krishna simply means the atmosphere, because vayu also means air. It not only means air when it's moving, it can just mean air. And so Krishna, when Krishna talks about the great air, Mahavayu, or the Maha great wind, I think we can take it as, uh, he's talking about the atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere. And so, Yata Akasha Stito Nityang Vayu Sarvatra Gomahan. So just as the great air is always situated in space. Now here you have to, that which is Akasha. You have to keep in mind here that in Bhagavad philosophy, uh, space is an element. It's an element. And, uh, and space doesn't mean air. It just means the element that is space that contains things. So for example, uh, let's say you have, there's, there's a vacuum chamber where there's no air whatsoever, but there's still space. You can measure how much space there is. So we, you can measure, for example, the space between you and the wall or between you and another person, whether there's air or not. It's just pure space. And the reason Krishna is using this example is because, as explained in the Sankhya philosophy, which is, of course, a little bit is found here and more is found in the Bhagavatam, um, air, not, not air, space, space being the fifth of the five great elements, the Mahabhutanis, uh, which are earth, water, fire, air, and ether, space, or you could also just call them uh, solids, liquids, radiant, 
elements, fire and uh, gases such as air, and then space, however you want to call them. But uh, of these five, space is unique in the sense that it does not interact with any of the other elements. It doesn't interact with any of the other elements. So for example, let's say you have earth and you add water, you get mud. So there's the, the earth and the water interact, they change each other. Or if you take, let's say, earth and water and add fire, then you're going to get clay. So again, they're all interacting. And the same with air. You know, air interacts with things. It causes some metals to rust. Uh, air can evaporate water. Uh, it can do all kinds of things. It can blow dirt away, like, you know, sometimes to, to clear the dust out of your computer, you like blow air in it. So, so all these four physical elements, earth, water, fire, and air, they all interact. Curiously, all four of them are situated within space, but space doesn't interact with any of them. There's no sense in which if you add water and space, what do you get? Well, you get water and space. It's not like they combine like earth and water or fire and water. It's not like that. Space contains everything, but doesn't interact. And Krishna is comparing himself to space. And he's comparing everything in this world to those other four elements. And saying that I contain everything, but I don't physically touch anything. I don't physically interact with anything. Everything is simply within me. But it's not in me in that sense. So that's the example Krishna's giving that the great air or the atmosphere is in space. Yata kasha stito nityam vayuk sarvata go mahan tata. It's in that sense, Krishna says, sarvani bhutani, all living beings, matstani, are in me, uh, iti upadharya. Thus, understand it. So, because you could say, oh, we're actually touching Krishna because if we're in Krishna, then I'm, I'm touching his body. No, you're not. Uh, because he's like space, he contains you, but you are not, if you can use that term, physically within Krishna. Like, I mean, just have this image of a baby kangaroo. I know many of you have pet kangaroos, just kidding. So, so the, the little kangaroo, it, it's carried in the pouch of the mother. So we're not in Krishna like a little kangaroo is in the mother's pouch. We're, it's not, or let's say a mother is holding a child. Uh, it's not like that. It's not a physical touch. It's not that kind of physical contact. We are within Krishna. But then again, we're not within Krishna in the way I just explained. So... Um, Anyway, the reason I brought that up is because going back now to the Isopanishad, um, where you have these paradoxes, like all living beings are in me, but they're not in me. So keep in mind the sense in which all living beings are not in Krishna, or not to speak of you know dead matter, which Krishna says is separated energy. So everything is within Krishna, but it's really not, in another sense. And so therefore, if you take all that away, the last two lines of this invocation, Purnasya Purnamadaya, Purnamevavasishate, taking the complete whole, as Prabhupada translates it, or taking fullness away from the full, the full remains, because the things that were taken away were never really within him, in the relevant sense here. So that's the point I'm making. By the way, uh, if you have any questions, because uh, there's some delay and sometimes I end the class and then the questions come. So Ananda Leela, I trust you can send the questions now. I haven't already done so. So that's this verse, Om Purnamada, 
Purnamidam. That is full, complete. And then, of course, there, there, there's more that you can say about this. Going now to a, a more personal level, not just sort of, I don't know, metaphysical or ontological, but looking at ourselves, there's a sense in which if you have a good life, if you're fortunate to have a good, happy life, to have good friends or family, I mean, there's a, and, and to really enjoy what you're doing, there's a sense in which you feel like my life is complete. Of course, ultimately, life can truly be complete only when we revive very strongly our connection with Krishna. But still, even if you're doing that, it's, or, or there's a sense in which we have a complete life. People, we have words in English and every and every other language like satisfied, complete, fulfilled. I mean, the reason we have those words is because people sometimes feel that way. And so, um, and there's a sense in which we have our integrity. So I'm going to read the definition of integrity and see if I got that right. Integrity means the quality of being honest. Okay, that's like being moral. The state of being whole and undivided. Uh, whole and so, and that's Purnam. So in that sense, the condition of being unified, I mean, the sense that we all have, if we are emotionally healthy, the sense that we all have of being somehow complete and full and fulfilled it's like, and if you're in Krishna consciousness, you realize that ultimately I can achieve all my desires. Krishna bhakti koyale sarva karma kritahoy. That simply by, shadha, this is in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, shadha shade, by the word shadha, or faith, or trusting, shadha shade vishwasa kahe, that we are. Um, saying actually vishwasa, trust or confidence. And so what is that trust? What is that confidence? The Krishna Bhakti Koile, simply by rendering devotional service to Krishna, Sarva Karma Krita Hoy, all actions will be done. I will be completely fulfilled, my life will be complete. Uh Everything will be done that I could hope for if I simply serve Krishna with real devotion. So that's the sense of fullness. It's it's the reason one becomes free of material desires as one advances in Krishna consciousness is precisely because you have a higher taste, as we put it, you know, param drishtva nivartati that we, we give up lower experiences because we, we experience something higher. So Krishna consciousness brings us to that satisfaction, that completeness, where you know that your life has gone in the best possible way because you surrender to Krishna and he's guided you. So... Um, and of course Purnat Purnamudakshate can also be taken to mean that the reason this world if you think about the world like if you're having a good time and you're in a beautiful place and you're with people you really care about and there's good food for some then you really have this sense of completeness, of, of, of satisfaction. And the reason we are capable of that sense of fullness and satisfaction is because we're part of Krishna. And he's the original Purna, he's Adi Purna, he's the original, complete, fulfilled, perfect being. And because we're tiny parts of him, if we live our lives properly, we also feel that satisfaction, that completeness, that contentment, that even in having a human body, if you think about it, 
the fact that you can see, that you can hear, you can touch, taste, you can smell. It's, there's just something complete about our ability to experience life if we live properly, if we have a good life. So, uh, apparently there are no questions, or usually they come just after I say goodbye, somehow or other, some cruel irony. But that's the first verse of the Esau Upanishad. And uh, so hopefully next Saturday, at the same time, we'll do the second verse. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending the class, everybody that did attend it, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a lot more fun than if I gave a class and absolutely nobody showed up. Uh, okay, now the question came. You see, I, that's why I was, I was stretching out my goodbye, because I knew inevitably a question would come in. So, uh, just looking through the comments here that you all make. And now I will go to the questions. Uh, let's see. Taoism, in Taoism, paradox plays an important part in conveying the truth of reality. So is this also in Vedic thought? Yeah, they do use paradoxes. Uh, paradox means an apparent contradiction that you have to think more about. Is paradox a crucial tool in the Vedic thinking? Uh, it's used. It's um, I describe it as a sort of a literary speed bump. It's like sometimes they put those in Brazil, they say lombadas, they put those bumps in the road. So if you're driving, you have to slow down. And so I think paradoxes, yeah, they're very much put there intentionally. It's a speed bump. So you have to slow down and think. You can't just rush through a sacred text. You have to think about it. So, okay, I'll translate this. Uh, so in Spanish, what nectar this meditation between taking credit and uh, not feeling ourselves to be the doers? Is that the platform of Sankirtan? Um, as I explained yesterday in Spanish in a class uh, with Cordoba, uh, when we do our duty, just like Krishna says at the end of Bhagavad Gita, that whoever uh, takes seriously this Bhagavad Gita will become Krita Kritya, which means their duty is done, a person whose duty is done. So when we do our duty properly, there is an extraordinary satisfaction. And we, we experience that we're pleasing Krishna. And because we're pleasing Krishna, we're also pleased, we're also happy. So there is a happiness that comes from doing one's duty. And uh, how can we distribute many of Prabhupada's books without getting puffed up? Uh, well, the same way we hopefully do everything else in Krishna consciousness without becoming inflado, inflated. That's how you say puffed up in Latin language, you always become inflated, without inflating oneself. Um, that's Krishna consciousness. Because if, if by Krishna's mercy you do something well, that's a temptation. It is a temptation to become proud, to take credit for it, and so on. And uh, you be, it's a spiritual exercise. Like you go to a gym and you try to lift weights, the weights are resisting you. That's what exercise is. It's when you have resistance to what you're trying to do. And so in the same way, uh, we are trying to serve Krishna, but that intention of serving Krishna is resisted. What's pushing against that, pushing back against our attempt to give credit to Krishna is the seduction of taking credit. Okay, I did that. So there's a tendency to become seduced by that or tempted by that. Okay, maybe I'll take the credit. And so in Krishna consciousness, we have to be strong. We, we 
for the workout, we exercise. And even though there's that temptation to take the credit, or on the other side, to become depressed or discouraged, we have to resist that and continue um, seeing Krishna as the real doer and, give, and seeing ourselves as simply instruments. So yes, when, when you do something well, or when something happens which you find discouraging, that is a test, it's an exercise, and so we have to strengthen our Krishna consciousness. If Krishna's parts are complete, why, when it comes to his expansions and avatars, is it mentioned that they only have a percentage of his full personality, I guess plenary parts, Krishna's plenary parts, I hope I'm asking the right question. Not bad. It's a pretty good, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, because when Krishna uh, manifests as a Vishnu or other forms uh, which don't have all the qualities of Krishna, it's not that Krishna, it's not that, for example, Vishnu is not fully God. Vishnu is God, Vishnu is Krishna. It's that just Krishna is not showing all of himself in that form. For example, let's say you go somewhere and there's people and because of the situation, because of the people that are there, you decide not to really open up, not to reveal everything about yourself. There are situations like that where we just go in some official capacity, or we may be with people we don't completely trust, so we don't reveal everything about ourselves. So, Krishna is Krishna, there's only one God, whether Krishna is appearing as Narayan or, or Govinda or whatever, it's always the same complete Krishna, but in certain forms he just doesn't reveal as much about himself. Um, if this material world is complete with trying to avoid an ecological catastrophe or trying to diminish social, I suppose increase social equality, be a form of maya, how do these things fit into Krishna consciousness? Um, the world is complete, but people with their demonic consciousness can injure the world. They can misuse what Krishna has given them. Of course, the completeness also is that when people injure nature, in, and nature will injure them, and ultimately nature will reassert itself, and the people who did these bad things will simply suffer, so nature ultimately will win. But um, in Krishna consciousness, we care about the earth. Prithu Maharaj, Prithu Maharaj was a great environmentalist who kind of landscaped the earth and made it produce all kinds of food. But we do it for Krishna. So we can take care of the earth. We should take care of the earth. And we want... The only way you're ever going to get social equality, really, as we're trying for so long, the only way is, is, is by spiritual consciousness. Because in spirit, because you can talk about social equality, it's funny because now everything is based on groups like different races or different ethnic groups or different nationalities. But what about individuals? We are not merely members of groups according to race, ethnicity, nationality. We're also individuals. So even if you try to make groups equal, what about individuals? Individuals still are not going to be equal. I mean, they have athletic events, someone wins, someone loses. Political events, someone wins, someone loses. Wars, someone wins, someone loses. So somehow there's this consciousness now that if we just somehow or other equalize the groups, who cares about the individuals? Which actually is, to be honest, it's sort of this leftover Marxism. Marx didn't think individuals that important. In fact, I just gave a talk on that to, uh, to our women's ministry in Brazil. And so I did a little research, and it was kind of horrible. I mean, Marx and Engels, they sort of openly say that 
Sometimes you may have to liquidate whole social classes, liquidate them, just get rid of them. That's called genocide. So, yes, there's where, what about individuals? So unless you have a spiritual consciousness that we're all equal as spiritual beings, then no matter what you do, there will be an equality. Whether it's at a group level, individual level, national levels, I mean, whatever. The idea that everyone will be identical materially, good luck. You know, let me know when you get there. But what we can do actually is see the real eternal equality and then treat each other with respect. For example, if I sit down, let's say, to play the piano, I mean, obviously, some people play much better than me. A lot of people play much better than me. But I'm not competing with them. I have a good life. I enjoy the music I make for Krishna. So the real point is to for everyone to be satisfied and happy with their own life. So that, uh, and you know, there's mutual respect, mutual appreciation. We all see each other as part of Krishna. So the solution is spiritual. Materially, like I said, good luck. So Spanish, I'll translate. Uh, would the appropriate way? Would it be the appropriate way to see Krishna's energy acting through us, so that we are sort of channels? Uh, or are we just being proud unconsciously? Well, first of all, uh, to be successful in spiritual life. You can't have a lot of unconsciousness. In other words, we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to take a good look at ourselves. What am I really doing? Am I taking pride right now? Am I showing off? Or am I really trying to serve Krishna? And so having the ability to look honestly at oneself is really necessary to do well in Krishna consciousness. So here's another one. Uh, can you tell us a story from the old days with you and Srila Prabhupada in a Volkswagen Bug? Well, very briefly, uh, it was 1972, August, New Vrindavan. It was Piyas Puja Day. And there was one GBC there was kind of a heavy type person who uh, wanted to control everything that was going on with Prabhupada. And so uh, Prabhupada finished his talk, we had a little Vyas Puja ceremony on the stage there, set up at New Vrindavan, and we had a I remember uh, Prabhupada asked all the sannyasis to come and speak a few words for Vyas Puja, so I also spoke, and then Vishnu Jana Swami actually led a Kirtani town to sing Sarah prayers, Prabhupada spoke, and then when, the, when that program was over, uh, a car was supposed to be there to take Prabhupada uh, back to his house where he was staying for lunch. And so there was some kind of mistake and, and the car wasn't there. So I thought, wow, opportunity. So I ran to my little bright yellow Volkswagen that a devotee in Dallas had actually given to me, a young Brahmacharya was very kind of him. His father gave it to him and he gave it to me. I'm sure his father was very happy about that. We didn't think about those things. And so, anyway, I had a bright yellow new Volkswagen, so I ran to my car and I, you know, went right up to the stage. So when Prabhupada came out the stage, the other car wasn't there, but my car was there, or maybe the other car was behind me. And I just said to Prabhupada, you know, we're ready. So I opened the door for Prabhupada, he got in my little Volkswagen, and I drove him back to his house, and the uh, the heavy GBC who wanted to control that he was very mad, and I was actually very happy because I had Prabhupada in the car. So uh, let's see: is it true that Sri Prabhupada predicted the future? Uh, he was very intelligent, and Krishna, obviously, to say the least. And so he said certain things that happened. It's uh, but Prabhupada's. Prabhupada was not into predicting. Sometimes he said certain things, but he was not speaking as a prophet. He was just kind of thinking like, so many years there'll be a war, the way things are going now, and of course there wasn't a war. 
he was talking about like a nuclear war that was supposed to happen decades ago. So, but in those cases, Prabhupada was just speaking as a uh, a wise, concerned person, like the way things are now, if things don't change, and they did change a bit. So, uh, but Prabhupada, the mood, that's why Prabhupada wasn't into astrology. I was personally in Prabhupada's room, sitting right next to him when the first ISKCON astrologers came and asked Prabhupada's permission to astrology in ISKCON. Prabhupada said he didn't want it. And anyway, the rest is history. Prabhupada said he didn't want it because he said whatever Krishna is going to do, he'll do it. Prabhupada said the whole mood of Krishna consciousness is not, consciousness is not to try to predict and control the future, but just depend on Krishna. Anyway, um, I know it's a controversial topic, I won't go on, but I've never really personally paid any attention to astrology and read Krishna's mercy, I've had a great life. So, thank you all very much. I think that's all the questions. Let me just look and see if I missed anything. Oh, thank you, got enough from Linda Leela. Okay, so thank you all very much. Appreciate your uh, being here for the class and I hope you'll tomorrow we do the Bhagavatam and the next Saturday so Pashad, hope you'll be there again one last question just came in let me see if it's relevant it's in Spanish uh, without doubt you have demonstrated the urgent necessity of pushing the Christian West program well thank you and to know, sort of tie ourselves in a, anyway, talking about Krishna West, uh, sort of making sort of a little bit of a criticism of ISKCON leaders, which I won't read. And so that's about Krishna West. Uh, the idea is keep everyone united. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Krishna West is not going around attacking anyone. We have a great program. It's growing, by the way. Krishna West is growing a lot. And I personally have absolutely no problem with any of the other leaders. So, uh, yeah, that's what's going on today. So thank you all very much. And I hope you'll all be there again next week. Hare Krishna.